Well, it is good to be with you guys. For those of you who are joining online, welcome in as well uh, to the service if you are new. And I can still see some new faces even through the masks. We love it that you are here. Welcome to Phoenix Bible Church. Um, Before I get into the sermon, I do have a a few important things I want to let you know about. And one of them is what's already been mentioned at the beginning of service is that today is the last day of one service at 9.30 a.m., Next Sunday is 9.30 and 11 a.m., two in-person worship services. And let me just tell you, we planned this a long time ago, pre-pandemic, if you were a part of our church. We were busting at the seams, bringing in new chairs every Sunday and, and trying to just keep up. And we planned to go to two services in the fall, uh, but not like this. Uh, not spaced out with masks on, but we're still going to do it that way. And uh, we're still excited for it. Amen. Uh, if you don't know, the reason why we do a second service isn't just like for logistical reasons. It's to open new doors for people to love Jesus, live like him, and lead others to him. That's why we do it. We just want to create another lane on the highway for people to come and meet Jesus and fall in love with him and give their life to him. And so that's what next Sunday is about. So you can start thinking about now, 9, 30, and 11, which service are you going to come to? Which service do you want to invite friends and family to? That starts next Sunday. And I know some of you want to serve. You've asked, how do we pull this off. Like, what do we need to do? It's a different time. And and let me just tell you, there's lots of things to do. You can join a team. Uh, That would be the best way to jump in. You can do that online. If you're watching online, click that button, join a team. Uh, If you're doing that, if you're in service, you can do that now on your phone. You can stop by the connect desk afterwards and just get in a rotation once a month serving. There's multiple ways to serve, contactless ways and and other ways. And so uh, we'd love for you to be a church family. And a church family all pitches in and is the body of Christ, even more importantly, and serves in the way they're gifted. And so we'd love for you to do that even this week if you haven't done so already. And one of the reasons it's so important that we announce this twice and send out emails and all the things we've done is because this week, you're not going to hear about two services via social media. And that's because if you missed it, uh, we're taking a break from social media as a church, like organizationally, like our Phoenix Bible Church accounts. We're pausing those so we can press in in other areas. Uh, If you missed the sermon last week, I'm not going to re-preach it, don't worry. I'm not going to re-preach that sermon, but go back on YouTube and watch it. What we talked about is what John talks about at the beginning of 1 John. Uh, That Jesus is that which is from the beginning, and that's first in sequence, but also in preeminence. Like he's meant to be first in our lives above everything else, and that anything that's above that, we need to pull down and replace with him. And so we talked about social media, and not just like Facebook and Instagram, like they're evil and of the culture, not like that, right? But just all that they imply and all that comes with that and all that it does to our hearts and to our minds. And, and the reality, if we're all just honest, if we were to assess, like is social media drawing us closer to Christ or further away, that the majority of people I talk to would say, further away. That the majority of us would say, hey, with all the racial divide, it's not actually helping bring it back together. If anything, it's contributing to that. It's not helping unleash us to do justice and reconciliation in our world. It's actually preventing some of that for most of us. And it's actually causing anxiety or outrage for a lot of us and disrupting even marriages and families and friendships. Like It's doing a lot of things to us. And so not just the, the social media, but what it does to our hearts and minds. And so this week, After calling you to do that and take a break from it, we just said, hey, if we're going to call other people to do that, organizationally, we're going to model that. And immediately fear creeps up in a pastor because it's like, well, how are people going to know about our church? How are people going to get saved without social media? How are people going to know what's going on without social media? Because we do a lot on social media. Some people watch our services on social media. They can still do it on YouTube and the website, but how's this going to go? We just thought, hey, the church, uh, Jesus says, the church um, will continue to advance, and even the gates of hell won't prevail against it, I think we'll be fine taking a break from social media. Right? Amen? And so we just said, hey, we're going to model this, and we invite you to take a break for a season. We're not sure how long it's going to last, but we're just going to pause that. Listen, pay attention. Pausing that, not to go dark or skip out or hide from culture, but to pause that to unleash us to press in on justice, love, truth of the gospel in our neighborhoods and in our city. Right? So that's where we're headed. So two services next Sunday. Make sure you get our emails. If you don't, you can fill out a Connect card to do that. Download the Phoenix Bible Church app. We'll communicate through those mediums. But I'm really expectant. At the very least, I think our church is going to be a lot more creative because we're going to reduce the time scrolling and start imagining how we can serve our community. Amen? So y'all come up with some good ideas, all right? 
over these next few months. I'm excited of what God is going to do. The last thing is we're going to do something we haven't done since March, which is take communion. And so when you walked in, if you're in the room, you should have picked up some prepackaged elements. Hold on to those till the end of the sermon. Uh, if you're at home, we actually created a whole page online for you to take communion, what it is, who should take it, how you take it, all those things. So uh, we direct you to that page at the end of the sermon. All right. For now, we're going to get into God's Word. You guys ready to do that? Okay, amen. You can talk back. It's okay. You can talk back. Um, First John, we're in part two of First John, this series entitled Beloved, written by John, the beloved disciple of Jesus. And, and that title, uh, John didn't just hold on to, like many of us with a best friend, right? If you've done this, like you have a best friend, he's your best friend, she's your best friend, and you're like, somebody else starts to talk to her and hang out with her a lot more than you, and you're kind of like, hey, it's my best friend, right? John doesn't do that. He's not like, well, I'm the beloved disciple of Jesus. It's nice to meet you. He doesn't flaunt that. No, what does he do? He extends it. Literally, if you read 1 John, he extends it five different times. That title that he has, he extends to his audience as he writes 1 John. He calls them the beloved. He wants desperately other people to experience what he's experienced, an up-close, personal, intimate relationship with Jesus, right? Right? You see, the reality is other disciples had an up-close relationship with Jesus. Like, he wants you to have an up-close relationship with Jesus. Just because John is the beloved disciple of Jesus doesn't mean you can't be called the beloved disciple of Jesus. In Jesus, that's what you are. So that's what we have the opportunity to experience as we open God's word, as we look at 1 John. God is inviting you to be his beloved, to walk in that, right? Now, as we look at the text today, we're going to see one thing that prevents that that prevents that up-close personal relationship with Jesus, that for many of us, as we walk in the room today, we don't feel like the beloved. And the reason is, and we're going to look at it in in John, the reason is darkness. The reason is sin. We're going to talk about sin today. Aren't you excited? We're going to talk about what prevents us, how to maintain an up-close personal relationship with Jesus, even in the midst of sin. What does it look like? What do we do with our sin? Uh, So we're going to look at that together. Grab a Bible with me. Open it up. Get God's Word in front of you. 1 John 1, 5 through 10. I'm going to read it for us, and then we're going to break it down. 1 John 1, 5 through 10. It says this. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us." Look at verse 5 with me. Intently, we see John say he has a message. And he says it's one he's heard and he now proclaims. And remember, John is, 1 John is less like a letter, more like a sermon. And we see it here, right? He's proclaiming a message. And notice where the message comes from. Verse 5, look at it. From him, from Jesus from the eternal who's been made accessible. John has a message he wants to preach to you, and it's coming directly from Jesus. Notice what John doesn't say. He doesn't say, you know, after a lot of thought and meditation and reading and imagination, like I have a message to give you. No, he says, I have a message I've heard directly from Jesus. Like, we need to be clear. This isn't Ricky Bobby and Talladega Nights, right? Anybody seen that at the dinner table? They're just kind of like imagining. Yeah, some of you have seen that. Some of you are more holy than us. Okay. Um, Because we've seen, I've seen that, and they're all just imagining. I like God, I like to think about God like this. And I just like to picture God like this. John's not doing that. John's saying, no, I have a, a message to proclaim, and it's directly from the source. I'm just repeating what Jesus said. I'm his beloved disciple. I walked closely with him, and I'm giving you his message. So this is the message he's about to give to us. So we need to be ready. Our ears should be perking up to be ready. What is this message that comes directly from Jesus? He says it in verse 5. He says, God is light. God is light. That's the message. Now, for some of you that may not 
that may not sink in of like, okay, well, God is light. Okay, what, is, what does that really look like? Well, in, in their day, they would have been very familiar with that concept of God being light. They would have been familiar with the concept of light. Now, we're all familiar, if you live in Phoenix, with light, right? Uninhibited by clouds, amen? And we see light every day. They were just as familiar with light, uh, but in biblical terms. You see, at the beginning of our Bibles, in Genesis, one of the very first things God says is, let there be light. Right? The middle of our Bibles, Jesus says in the Gospels, I am the light of the world. Right? At the end of our Bibles, in the book of Revelation, we see that the glory of Jesus will shine so brightly we won't even need the sun and we see light. And so John's audience was familiar with this concept of light, but, but here's what he's talking about. As we see light in the Bible, it's a common metaphor to describe God. Here's the two primarily, primary things that it means. One is knowledge. Knowledge. Psalm 119, we see this. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Right? That when it says God is light, that means he's true. He, he's perfect knowledge. But it also means that he's perfect. He's pure. He's holy. Isaiah 5.20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. He says, light is holiness. Light is goodness. When things are in the light, when they're revealed to be true, that's God. He's perfect. He, he's perfect in knowledge. He's perfect in holiness. And what Isaiah does is he contracts light with darkness. John does the same thing. Right? Look at verse 6. He says, if we say we have fellowship, that's the original word uh, koinonia, which means shared life. If we say we have shared life with him, with God, the light, while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. See, John says, here's the thing about light and darkness. They don't hang out. They don't mix together. So he gives a stark contrast. God is light. But if we walk in darkness, right, and you're meant to see that contrast, you're meant to see the disparity, that we don't have perfect knowledge, we don't have perfect truth, that we're not perfect, we're not holy and pure, God is, but we are not. But what John says is a little nerve-wracking, because he says, if you say you have fellowship, shared life with God, but you're walking in the darkness, then you are a liar. And I think objectively, if we were to look at light and dark and and holy and sin, we would say, well, those things don't match up. And so if we say that we have a relationship with God who is light, who is holy, but we are not holy, objectively, we would say something's off there, right? It's what you see when you go to a restaurant and somebody uh, is praying before a meal at the table right next to you, but yet when their waitress comes, they're a jerk to that waitress. And you, you heard the prayer, and then you see the life, and you're like, something doesn't match up, Right? Christian or not, you just see that and you're like, something doesn't match up with that. Something doesn't match up when you walk into a church on a Sunday and you see somebody hands lifted high, singing their lungs out, but then you see them on Monday doing shady business deals. And we all see that no matter where we are, we're like, that's light and dark. They're, that's different. Like you say you have a relationship with God, but you're not living that out. Like something is off. Like we say that objectively, typically about other people, but when we think about our own lives, we get a little scared of that truth, right? Like, it's easy to see when it's other people, like, light doesn't match darkness, and, like, what's going on there? But for us, we're like, but, like, I have good intentions. <laughs> like, if I'm walking in the darkness, and, but I have good intentions, and I'm trying to do the right thing, God, and, and like, but it's, it's okay. Like, I'm in fellowship with you, though, right? And we start to get a little nervous. And just so you know, this passage and some verses that we single out and we don't read the context, they make a lot of people nervous, like 1 John is the, one of the most misquoted books of our Bible. Because instead of going through the whole book in context, people pick out verses and they use them for their own agenda. And so some of you maybe have been in church where you heard this verse by itself and you're like, if you're in fellowship with God, you say that, but you have sin or darkness in your life, then you're really not. You're a liar. And you're just like, I'm not a Christian, Tim? What? And that's when you came down to the aisle for the fifth time. And you're just like, Jesus, please. <laughs> Like, let me be in heaven, I promise, this time, because you're just scared that you're going to hell because you have some darkness and sin in your life. And so some of you may be feeling that right now. But that is why we go through the book of the Bible, we read the other verses, and we look at verses like 8 and 10. Look at verses 8 and 10 with me. What do we see John say? He says that if we are 
Let me catch my place. John makes two similar statements. If we claim to be perfect without sin, if we claim to be without sin, verse 8, we deceive ourselves. Verse 10, we make God a liar. So being in the light, being in fellowship with God, can't be about attaining perfection. Same author, just a few verses later, says, actually, if you say you don't have any sin or any darkness, you're deceiving yourselves and you're actually calling God a liar because God knows you're fallen. God knows you're sinful. God knows you have darkness, right? And so we, we first have to, to read these verses and see, okay, walking in the light, being in fellowship with God, can't mean that we don't have any sin. We don't have any darkness. John explicitly says, if you say you don't have sin, if you say you don't have darkness, you are deceiving yourselves and you're making God out to be a liar. So it doesn't mean that. What does it mean? Look at verse 7. Verse 7, it says this. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Look at those two phrases. Walk in the light and cleanses us from all sin. Walk and cleanses. Those are both in the present tense, meaning they're active words. They're happening now and they're ongoing. They're continuous. And so here's what John is saying is, as you walk in the light, you are being cleansed from your sin, from your darkness. That it's not so much about a destination of perfection as it is a journey of the perfect blood of Jesus cleansing you from your sin, right? That's what John is talking about. You're walking in the light. You're walking with Jesus in fellowship. You do have some darkness, but God's pointing those things out, and he's slowly cleansing you from those things, right? So it's not that you're perfect. It's not that you've, light is a destination one day. If I try hard enough, I'll reach it. No, it's a, it's a path. You're walking and God's cleansing. You're walking and God's cleansing you in Jesus Christ by his blood on your behalf. All right? So first, for many of us, the first step to walking in the light is admitting we are not in it. You see, many of us, because we hear these kind of languages and we're just like sin and darkness, we're like, I don't want that, so I'll just pretend I don't have it. And, and what God is actually talking about, no, 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 that's not what I'm after. I want you just to be honest about admitting that you are not in the light so he can bring you along in the light, right? And, and that's what we see in this text. But for many of us, we have a problem with admitting that we're in darkness, Many of us, we have a problem admitting how bad it is. And notice the language, the imagery John gives us. He says darkness. Paul in Ephesians 2 says we're dead without Christ. We don't like that language, right? We use other language. Like, you know, Tim, I'm, I'm trying. I'm, I'm sure I'm not perfect, uh, but I'm not as bad as those people, whoever those people are. I mean, Tim, like, if I just, I need more time, like, right? I'm only 30, 40, 50 years old, 60 years old. I got more time. I need some more education. I need a better day. I need this pandemic to be over. Like, I need my kids to go, to go back to school, and then I'll do something with my anger, and, like, then I'll replace it with some good deeds, and, and at some point, I'll stack enough good deeds up upon the, the bad deeds, and like a seesaw, like, I'll kind of end up on top. And that's how we describe our lives. We don't say darkness. We don't admit the, the dark parts of our heart. We don't go to those extremes. Why? Because it's heavy when we do that. It's hard to do that. It's easy to point it out in other people. It's harder to do it for ourselves. And let me just tell you, in 2020 with the quarantine, this has been heavy and hard for all of us. All routines, all comforts have been taken away, and all you got left, you don't have the distractions. All you got left is you and God. Your heart has been exposed. My heart has been exposed. And we've seen some things that we don't like. And they were already there, but we're just seeing them more clearly, like racism, like indifference, like self-righteousness, like lies, like lust, like gossip, like greed, like pride. And for some of us, this season has been so hard, and it's because we've had to face our darkness. And before, we just turned up the radio. Before, we just put on sports. Before, we just scrolled through social media. And even right now, some of you are like, can I do that right now? Because <laughs> you're talking about my darkness. Like, where's the exit door? Like, get me out of here. I don't want to face my darkness. But listen, here's the reality, and here's what John's going to show us, is that the way to actually healing is by facing your darkness. The way to forgiveness is by facing and coming to grips 
with your darkness. The way to walking in the light is admitting that you aren't in it. Right? So we have to face the darkness. I know for me, um, when I'm in the dark, bad things happen. Like I bump into things and I can't see. And, and, and I know for me, like and many of you, what needs to happen is I need to turn on the light. And so for many of us, we, we have to realize it's dark around us, and we got to start looking, where's the light switch? Like, how, how, do, we, how do we change this up? I, I see the darkness, and some of you are seeing the darkness. How do we change it up? How do we turn on the light? Just the other night, I was going to the bathroom in the middle of the night. It was completely pitch dark. We usually leave a few night lights on for the kids, but really for me. And I'm kind of groggy and woke up, need to go to the bathroom. And I'm in the bathroom, but I can't find the toilet. <laughs> And I can't find the sink. And, but instead, I find some shoes and some clothes hanging up. And I was in the closet. I wasn't in the bathroom. And luckily, I did not go to the bathroom in the closet, right? What did I do? I reached up in the closet and I turned on the light. Right? So how do we walk in the light? We need to face our darkness and we need to turn on the light. How do we turn on the light? John's going to tell us. Look at verse 9 with me. John says, here's how we turn on the light. It's confession and forgiveness. Confession and forgiveness. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession and forgiveness. Something we talk about in church all the time but rarely practice. Amen? Confession and forgiveness that we, we do. We confess We see the darkness for what it is. We admit that it's there. We don't try to pretend that it's not. We're not those people who are really sick, but don't go to the doctor. Because if we don't go to the doctor, like I know I'm sick, but if I don't go, then he won't be able to tell me. I won't have to face reality. I won't have to start taking the meds. I can just act like the sickness is not there. But what happens? Meanwhile, you're pretending the sickness is not there, but it's killing you. We don't do that. But many of us, That is what we do. And for many of us today, you've been faced with some darkness, but instead of turning on the light and confession and repentance, you're just acting like it's not there. Because if you were to look at all the lies and all the gossip and all the pride and all the prejudice and all the greed and all the self-righteousness, if you were to really look at that, you feel like, I would be hopeless because I can't fix all those things. And so, yeah, Tim, I am pretending it's not there. Sports is back. I can just turn it on. I could just keep going. And listen, there's confession, but there's also, by God's grace, forgiveness. Amen? You can see all your sin. You can see all the darkness because you have a Jesus who will forgive you. And some of you are thinking, Tim, you don't don't understand my sin. I mean, I'm sure that's true for you. Like, you're a religious pastor. Like, that's true for you, but it's not true for my. You don't know what I did last night. You don't, know my, you don't know what these last six months have done to my heart and my head. You don't know my thoughts. You don't know the, the things I want to do to other people on Facebook. Goodness. I mean, Tim, you don't know. Like, how are you so sure there's forgiveness from God for me? And if you're thinking that, you need to lean into verse 9. Look at it closer. God bases our forgiveness after the confession. He bases that purely on the character of God, not the content of people. Look at what he bases it on. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. He is just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That forgiveness, when we see all the darkness, the way the light comes in, he shows us the darkness, the way we're cleansed from that, the way it's not too much to handle, the way we can be freed up, the way we can raise our hands and say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. The reason why we can do that is because God is faithful and God is just. That God is faithful. He loves you. He keeps his promises. So when he says in Psalm 103, he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities, as far as the east is from the west. So far does he remove our transgressions from us. When we read that promise, we can know, we can trust God is faithful. He's going to keep it. And he does keep it through Jesus. We can see that God is just, that he's fair, that on the cross, Jesus died in your place 
for your sins. So that now when you confess sin, he doesn't hold it over your head. He doesn't condemn you. Why? Because 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who knew no sin, Jesus, to be sin on our behalf. Not just so we could be forgiven, but so that we can be made into his righteousness. He sent his sinless son to die for all of your sin. He's just. No sin will go unpunished. No racism will go unpunished. No injustice will go unpunished. You need to hang on to that today. God is justice. God is just. No lie, no pride, no gossip and greed will go unpunished. It was either punished at the cross or will be punished in hell. Because God's just. And sometimes we don't like that second part, but you need to know, we love that God is just. We love that God has taken care of sin on our behalf through Jesus and given us his righteousness. Come on. God brings forgiveness. It's the great exchange. He takes our sin and gives us his righteousness. And he does that because he's, he's just. He's faithful and he's just. He can't, listen to me, no matter what you did last night or in the last six months, he can't now condemn you for that or hold that over your, your head. Why? Because he's already taken his punishment out on his perfect son at the cross. Right? It would be like if God holds it over your head right now, your lie, your gossip, your pride, your greed, your racism, whatever it is for you, it would be like if, if God's holding that over your head and condemning you, it'd be like sending two people to prison for the same crime. J Jesus already paid the debt. Right? Jesus already was punished. Jesus was perfect, the sinless lamb. It was complete punishment so we could be forgiven, to be forgiven. That all of our debt, that's what forgiveness means, has been wiped away, has been canceled, has been banished. Like all your student loans, imagine that, gone, right? All your mortgage, wiped away. Come on, hallelujah, I would love that. I'm not giving you that today, just to be clear. <laughs> But that's what it is spiritually. He's taken it all away. And listen, it's not just he's taken it all away. He's replaced it with his righteousness. You are forgiven fully, finally, freely in Christ. Not because of your conduct, but because of his character. That's the truth of the gospel. That is why we raise our hands when we sing, Kyle. That's why we do it even with masks on. Because God did this for us. It's not about what you do. It's about what he's already done done. So how do we turn on the light? We begin to practice confession, seeing our darkness, but also experiencing the glorious forgiveness of God. Right? Now, I think for a lot of us, it's easy to practice confession for other people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I remember watching Lance Armstrong, seven-time Tour de France winner, uh, we used to live in Austin, so we had an extra affinity for, for Lance Armstrong. And I remember watching when he confessed, finally, for doping, illegal drugs, he confessed finally to Oprah. Because, of course, right? <laughs> Oprah. Um, and I remember watching on the news when this happened. We lived in Austin at the time, and I remember watching. They were live on site at a bar in Austin. And all these cyclist fans, they were watching the same thing we were watching, Lance Armstrong confess. And, and they began to interview all the people in the bar, and all the people in the bar were just astounded. How could he? Lance? Really? Like, I, why did he deny it? Seven years of the Tour de France? How could you deny that so long? Lance, like, what, why didn't you just confess it? And what I thought about is, man, we are so in tune. We have a formula for other people's confession. It's so obvious, isn't it? We, 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 we rehearse it in the shower. Come on. We're like, yeah, that politician, like, I'm creating, I can write the script of his confession. My spouse, oh, goodness. Well, the last six months, like, and you're thinking, like, this sermon, like, preach it, brother, like, this is good for him. Because you know how he needs to confess. You know how she needs to confess. You got it dialed in, but your confession, that's a little harder. I don't like to think about that. Listen, that's why I love John says, notice in verse 9, he says, if we confess... If we confess, he doesn't say, if you dirty sinners confess. He says, no, I'm in this. I'm taking personal ownership of this. I need to confess. 
And some of you are thinking, well, Tim, that's different. I mean, John's the beloved disciple, like the, the dearly loved by Jesus. Like he was an apostle. He probably didn't have any sin to confess. And what I would tell you is you need to read the Gospels and see that John's first uh, nickname was Son of Thunder. And that he held true to that nickname in Luke chapter 9 when a village of people denies Jesus and rejects Jesus. And John says, hey, Jesus, you know what we should do? We should rain down fire upon them from heaven. Same John. He's an old grandpa now, but he was once a son of thunder. Right? What changed? He turned on the light. He began to experience confession and forgiveness. He began to live in his identity in Christ as the beloved disciple of Christ, just like you can live in. Right? He turned on the light. So all of us have some darkness. The first step to walking in the light is not hiding it. God sees it. He knows it, and he wants to replace it with his glorious light. He wants to forgive you and make you righteous. He wants you to walk with him and walk with other people because of his character, not your conduct. Right? That's why we take communion. That's what we're about to do in a moment. We have the opportunity to experience confession and receive the forgiveness of God. Let's pray as we prepare our hearts to do that. Father in heaven, God, I pray right now we would pray along with David. Search my heart. See if there's any offensive ways in me. That we would stop thinking about the sin and darkness of others and even our world. And God, we would start thinking about the darkness within us. And God, as heavy as that is, that's the way to healing. So, God, I just pray for all the people watching online. God, I pray for all the people in this room that we would have a moment where we can face our sin and we can stop hiding it. God, I, I just, my heart burns for so many people who are just pretending it's not there and it's killing them. And, God, you've provided this moment for that to end, for, for us collectively, me included, to start calling out our sin by name, all the lies, all the lust, all the gossip, all the greed, the things you already know are there. God, we would just admit those things are there so we could be forgiven, so we could be restored to fellowship with you, so we could walk in the light as you are in the light, so we could experience the joy of knowing you in an up-close, personal, intimate way as John describes. God, help us to take that moment now. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.